Chapter 731 Wiped Out The Adorade spread its wings and flew past the bloodhorned Shura. She swung her great sword and sliced the arm and shoulder of one. The bloodhorned Shura that was dealt the blow, however, acted as if it did not even feel pain. Without a care for the bleeding puncture, it swung its beast soul sword towards the Adorade's neck. Other bloodhorned Shura approached the Adorade as this went on, in an attempt to surround her. She swung her great sword again and decapitated the Shura she had already injured, before dashing away to avoid the attacks of the rest. The bloodhorned Shura did not seem to fear death, and this made it increasingly difficult for the Adorade to finish the fight quickly. The first stage angel gene fluid is clearly not as effective as we would have hoped. Plainly, they cannot compete with super creatures just yet. Their effectiveness against an evolver with an open gene lock would be much higher, Zhao Lian thought to himself, as he recorded the combat data he was obtaining from observing the Bloodhorn Shura. Although he could not use machinery to more accurately log the battle and performance of the combatants, he had sharp eyes, and his records would more than suffice. But non-evolvers are unable to cope with the mutation of their genes. If they could, the angel gene fluid would have been enough to allow humans to slay super creatures in the first god sanctuary. It's a shame, really. Zhao Lian then turned his gaze to Han Sen and continued to think, perhaps they may not be able to kill a super creature, but killing a human should be no problem for them. Even if he is a top evolver, with powerful beast souls and a high fitness level, there is no way he stands a chance against them. While Zhao Lian was deep in thought, Hansen summoned a crossbow that resembled a peacock. He withdrew a bolt from his quiver and loaded it. He wants to use a crossbow to kill the Shura? Pa, he is naive. With their speed, I doubt he'd be able to hit any of them, even if he had a berserk sacred blood crossbow with berserk sacred blood bolts. Zhao Lian raised his lips, confident in the bloodhorn Shura. He had been in charge of the research program of the angel gene fluid and was well aware of the terrifying power the subjects wielded upon consumption of the substance. Even elites with an open gene lock, upon facing one of these test lab shura, didn't stand a chance. The only advantage such evolvers had were the skills of their open gene lock. But in every other facet, they would be inferior. The eight shura surrounding Hans and began to swing their weapons toward him with bloodlust. Their power and speed made for a frightening combination. Eager to see what would happen next, Zhao Lian began to get excited. Experimentation and improvements to the angel gene fluid were still ongoing. It would only be deemed complete when they could remove its negative side effects and humans could freely consume it. Once it was complete, the Zhao family believed it would usher in a new era for humanity. Zhao Lian was the lead of this entire project and he would be recognized as the person responsible. This also put him first in line for trying the final product out. But in the next second, Zhao Lian was turned to stone. Despite the scary Shura surrounding him, Hansen raised the crossbow, which emitted a number of black flashes. The bolts pierced through each of the Shura's heads, one by one like the tumbling of a circle of dominoes. Eight of them were killed in no time at all. They all crumpled to the ground, none of them managing to get within two meters of the person they had sought to kill. How is that possible? No way. Zhao Lian's eyes were wide open in disbelief, having great difficulty comprehending what he had just seen. He did not understand how the Bloodhorn Shura could have been so easily killed by a crossbow like that. The Super Pet itself seemed to have a harder time killing its foes. Hansen is stronger than the Super Pet? That's impossible. That crossbow must be a Super Beast soul. It's the only explanation. Damn it. How can Hansen own something like that? How many super creatures has he truly killed? Zhao Lian quickly realized his mission today had failed. For as long as Hansen wielded that crossbow, he knew the Shura would pose no threat to him. Although the advantage he had counted on had quickly disappeared, Zhao Lian did not panic. He continued to record what he could see, the battle of the Shura and the Adorate, in particular. Within half an hour, the Adorate had managed to kill the remainder of the Shura. The time it took for the event to come to a close was half as long as Zhao Lian had predicted. As expected, these Bloodhorn Shura still lacked the required strength and skill to tackle super creatures. When the battle was almost done, Zhao Lian packed up in a hurry and got ready to leave the area. Hansen observed the dead bodies that lay strewn about and frowned. The bodies of the Bloodhorn Shura, after being killed by the Adorade, began to rot quickly. Even the horns on their heads decomposed as their mangled bodies reduced to thick, bloody mush on the ground. 
It was a grotesque sight. What are these things? Hansen frowned. Clearly, they weren't creatures, but neither were they humans. And if they were indeed Shura, as he initially suspected, there was something different about them. Hansen's thoughts turned to Zero, but she was vastly different than these monsters, as well. Regardless of whether Zero was in human or Shura mode, she did not have a disfigured body akin to the creatures he had just fought. Her body cleanly represented either a human shape or a Shura shape. These things cannot be a natural creation of this world. Humans must have constructed these beings. Whoever created these and set them loose upon me obviously wants to see me dead. But who would do such a thing? Hansen frowned again. Angel Jean seemed like the most likely candidate, but Hansen had once offended the Dong Lin company before, too. And it was no secret how good Dong Lin was when it came to manufacturing such things. But there were more than two companies in the alliance that researched genes, so even though he believed Angel Jean was the most likely suspect, he couldn't be 100% sure. Hansen did not continue. Instead, he returned to the nearest shelter and teleported back to the Alliance. If his opponent was willing to do this to him, he was afraid of what they might do to his family. No one would dare come after him in the Alliance, especially now that he was counted as one of the G family. Furthermore, he was a member of the Special Squad. No one would come after him there. And after all, with the technology available there, discovering who might be after him would be far easier. It was different than the shelter. So, the first thing he did when he returned to the Alliance was try to contact his mother. He wanted to tell her not to spend much time in the shelter and remain in the Alliance for as long as she could. Or at least, wait until he arrived there to protect her. But when Hansen called his mother, he received no answer. This made Hansen's heart jump with worry. Hansen called Qin Xian and asked her to send a few members of the special squad over to protect his mother and escort her out of the shelter, if they could. Chapter 732 The Devil Doesn't Believe in Tears Hansen was worried, as this wasn't like before. If his attackers were ordinary elites, then the special squad would have no issue protecting anyone. But the Shura he had encountered didn't even seem human. As such, Hansen was worried about the safety of his mother if she remained out in the shelter. Qin Shin heard what Hansen had to say and quickly contacted her supervisor, asking where Luo Sulan had gone. She was out in the shelter, and members of the special squad had escorted her on a hunt. Qin Shin told Hansen she had already sent people to find her, and she firmly believed it would not be long before they returned. The Blue Crystal Shelter was near the Bukta Mountains, and Luo Sulan was out on a hunt under the protection of Wu Qi Gang. Although she already had a lot of Geno points, her combat skills and prowess were still somewhat lacking. She had not yet even been able to deal with a mutant creature. When fighting one, the frustration of watching her fight compelled Wu Qi Gang to help her finish them off. From what Wu Qi Gang could see, women like her were best reserved for being of the elegant sort. He thought she would be better off never touching a weapon, and instead being waited on, hand and foot, by men. He thought she should forego the desire for combat and stick to enjoying girly or things like flowers and romance. There was no explicit need for her to come out and hunt. With her son's power and position, he could just keep sending her the flesh necessary for her to max out her sacred Geno points. But every month, Luo Sulan would request an expedition to go out and hunt. She only wanted to kill ordinary mutant creatures, and Wu Qi Gang would always be fraught with the desire to help her when he watched her try to deal with the monsters she sought to fight. A woman such as her, he thought, was not built to fight. Particularly not to fight such wretched creatures. Although Wu Qi Gang felt this way, he never slacked in his duty to protect her. The last thing he wanted was for her to be harmed. He was aware that her son was also a member of the special squad, but the protection of others was a fundamental responsibility of all those who wished to be a part of the special squad. Anyway, Wu Qi Gang would give his life to assure her security. Suddenly, a roaring sound came from the nearby woods. A black tiger leapt out of the brush, fast like a shadow. It's a sacred blood creature, a black shadow tiger. Why has it ventured here? Wu Qi Gong's face changed. Black shadow tigers tended to reside in the deeper recesses of thick forests and had no reason to be anywhere near here. Mrs. Han, hide behind me and do not flee. Wu Qi Gang stepped in to eliminate the mutant creature, removing it from the field of play. Then, he walked in front of Luo Sulan. Seeing the Black Shadow Tiger approach, Wu Qi Gang drew his long sword and ran to meet it. Wu Qi Gang could kill sacred blood Black Shadow Tigers, 
but doing so would be more difficult while having to protect Luo Sulan at the same time. But then, more roaring came from the woods. Things took a turn for the worse as another two creatures emerged from the forest. It took Wu Qi Gang a moment to acknowledge what he was seeing, but when the realization struck, it struck hard. His face dropped, watching two more sacred blood creatures emerge from the woods. Mrs. Han, ride your sacred blood mount back to the shelter. I will keep them busy. Wu Qi Gang rushed into battle with the Black Shadow Tiger as he bid for Luo Sulan to escape. Little Wu, please be careful. Luo Sulan summoned the sacred blood mount Han Sen had given her and exited the area with haste. Wu Qinggong's sword shone with a blinding light as he fought to buy her the time she needed to reach absolute safety. She had reached the bottom of the mountains, not a great distance away from the blue crystal shelter. Once she had left that place, she would be safe. But as Luo Sulan rode her sacred blood mount, nearing the exit, a dozen people appeared in front of her. They barred her passage and surrounded her mount. Mrs. Han, it would be best if you came with us. A leader of sorts stepped forward to speak, and as he finished his line, delivered a half-smile. Who are you people? And why should I follow you? Luo Sulan asked, frightened at their sudden approach. Do not worry. We do not plan on bringing you harm. We are here to bring you reunification with your son, the middle-aged man said. What happened to little Sin? Luo Sulan quickly asked. You will know once you come with us, the man said, with a frosted tone. I'm not going with you, Luo Sulan said, as she nibbled her lips. Why do you even bother talking to her? Just capture her already, another man coldly interjected. Okay, then, the other man then gestured with his hand, and the rest approached her. They knew all about Luo Sulan. She was a housewife who killed a few ordinary creatures to survive. She has been taken care of through the kindness of others, unable to fight for herself. They had already separated her from the assigned protector of the special squad, which meant capturing her would be an easy task to accomplish. You guys have parents. How do you think they would feel if they knew you were out here, attempting to kidnap a lone woman? Luo Sulan sighed as she spoke. Shut up. If you refuse to come with us peacefully, take one last look at that silky smooth skin of yours. Before we cut it up and drag you away with us, Zhang Fang coldly told her. To suffer in the adversity of evil is a nobler deed than to helplessly succumb to the brutish requests of those that wish to do you harm, Luo Sulan said. Then consider our patience and politeness spent. Excuse the rough mishandling that may occur next. Zhang Fang raised his hand and tried to grab Luo Sulan by her hair and pull her off the mount she was upon. Just when Zhang Fang's hand was about to touch Luo Sulan, she raised her silky smooth hand and casually waved it in front of Zhang Fang's neck. Plop. He was only two feet away, and Zhang Fang's head was removed from his neck as if it were severed by an invisible knife. The head went a great distance as a trail of blood followed in its airborne wake. The eyes were sullen and seemed to suggest that what had just happened wasn't fair. Have any of you ever felt hopeless? Luo Sulan's face was like ice. She did not look scared or afraid at all. She looked devoid of emotion, cold. Just cold. Their hearts shivered as chills ran down their spines. Arg. Blood spread all about like flowers. She quickly moved around, and with each directional turn, red syrup followed. Devil. You are the devil. Du Ruji was petrified with fear. All the elites around him, including Zhang Fang, and two with open gene locks, they most likely had the power to slay or capture a super creature. If they didn't possess such power, it would have been impossible for them to shake out three sacred blood creatures to attack and draw away Wu Qi Gang. But the elites were now mercilessly slain by a woman that only had to walk ten quick steps to sever each elite's head from their neck. Yet with the claret blood that sprayed and flowed, not a single droplet stained the woman's clothing. Luo Sulan still looked as elegant and as gentle as ever. The woman stood in front of Du Ruji, who no longer thought she was a pretty woman. She was now the devil. The woman was about to take her last, eleventh step, when Du Ruji's legs seemed to crumble and almost sent him falling to the ground. He couldn't even think of running away due to how scary she was. She was truly scarier than the devil. Don't, don't kill me. I still have my parents, and I have a wife and kids. Duruji slobbered his plea for mercy after dropping down to his knees. The devil doesn't believe in tears. Luo Sulan gave Duruji was one last, cold look. She swung her hand, and another head rose to the sky with an airborne wake of blood. Chapter 733 
This must be a hallucination. The Blue Crystal team found Luo Sulan out near the mountains and quickly brought her back to the shelter. Wichi Gang killed one sacred blood creature and managed to chase away the other two before returning himself. The Blue Crystal team believed things were not as simple as they might have initially seemed, as those sacred blood creatures should not have appeared where they were in the first place. But aside from their intrusion, nothing else happened. Luo Sulan was safe. Although it was strange, Luo Sulan's safety was all that mattered. After she returned to the shelter, she teleported to the Alliance. Near the base of the mountains, the ground seemed disrupted. The soil seemed fresh, as if something had been recently buried. Mom, are you okay? Qin Shin had told Hansen what had occurred at the shelter, and he found it strange, as well. But if they wanted to bring harm to his mother, it didn't seem like the attraction of the three sacred blood creatures would be enough. I'm fine. What could have possibly happened to me? Luo Sulan asked. Mom, I may have offended someone in the shelter. They have tried to come at me already, but they were unsuccessful. Since they could not take out their grievances on me, I fear they may come for you, my family, in response. As such, I don't believe you should leave the safety of the Alliance for the time being, Hansen told her directly. He could not hide things from his mother, and for the issue that currently concerned him, he had to tell her the entire truth so she could understand the gravity of the situation. If she did not, and happily left the safety of the Alliance, she might find herself in trouble. What had happened was strange, yes, but Hansen did not want anything else to happen to her. Until he reached his mother's location, he did not want her to leave the Alliance. Little Sin, who did you offend? Will something happen? Luo Sulan worriedly asked. Don't worry, I can handle all this. Your son is strong now, Hansen smiled as he spoke. It's my fault, for being unable to protect you. Luo Sulan spoke, with a tone of sadness. Mom, it was difficult enough for you to raise me. Now, I should be the one protecting you, Hansen quickly told her. Little Sin, do you still have your great-grandfather's relic? Luo Sulan asked him, seemingly randomly. Of course I do. Do not worry for that, Mom. I always carry this pendant, Hansen said. All right, then. A look of relief then washed over Luo Sulan. After hanging up the communicator, Luo Sulan's expression was complicated. She thought to herself, after all these years spent working so hard, can we still not escape this loop? After Hansen confirmed his mother's safety, he decided to resume his journey to the Blue Crystal Shelter. The Black Desert. An endless black desert that looked like the inside of Hell's Furnace. The colors were bleak and hopeless, far more depressing than an average desert. Hansen was riding Golden Growler through the Black Desert, and because of the region's vast size and barren wastes, he looked lonely and small in its midst. I wish I did not have to eat or drink. At least I would feel better in this damn place, if I did not have to. Hansen had been on his traversal of the Black Desert for six days, before realizing he was lost. A massive black sandstorm had kicked up two days prior, which was quite threatening. It did not harm Hansen, but in his escape, he ended up losing all sense of direction. Hansen now focused on walking in a single direction, in the hope he could wander out of the black desert before exhausting all of his nutrient solutions. The silver fox didn't look comfortable under the sunlight. It still remained perched on Hansen's shoulder, but it used its own tail as a shield or fluffy parasol to block the sunlight. It also yawned a lot. A shelter? Hansen saw a really large building in the middle of the black sands he traversed, which made him open his eyes wide. Even if it wasn't a human shelter, and as long as it wasn't a super shelter, he could venture inside and obtain a new spirit. If he did that, he could teleport back to the Alliance and have a hot shower. He could rest, restock, and prepare himself once more. Hansen hurried his golden growler, wanting to approach the place faster. He keenly observed the shelter as he drew closer and closer. It was fairly small, so he became certain that it wasn't a super shelter. From how small it actually seemed, it didn't even seem royal shelter-sized. He assumed it was more likely a noble shelter. But when he got closer, Hansen began to feel a little disturbed. The shelter looked a little disheveled and rugged. It didn't look to be in total ruin, but it most certainly looked like an ancient city that had been abandoned a long time ago. This cannot be an abandoned shelter. Oh, please, God, let the teleporter still be functional, Hansen prayed in his heart. As he got closer to the Yellowstone City, things were not as bad as they initially seemed. It was indeed a human shelter, and before the front gate, 
he noticed a giant parasol had been placed. Under the parasol was a sunbathing bench with a person lying on it. There was a beautiful woman lying there. She had nice long legs with short black hair. Her butt was firm and round like a peach, whose limelight was only stolen by her large boobies. Her waist was slim but solid, and you could s be a little muscle there. In the middle of this boring black desert, Hansen's eyes almost fell out at how amazing this sight was. How could Hansen see it so clearly? Because the short-haired lady was naked, sunbathing on the bench in a relaxed posture. Are my eyes playing tricks? Am I suffering a hallucination, having been in the black desert too long? Maybe it really is a mirage. Hansen rubbed his eyes hard, wanting to confirm what he was seeing was actually true. The Yellowstone City was still there. The parasol and the sunbathing bench were still there, as was the beautiful lady. But Hansen still did not believe it to be true. He put the golden growler back in the Sea of Soul and sped up his approach to the Yellowstone City. He ran there as fast as his legs could carry him. As Hansen got closer and closer, the image of the place he had discovered became clearer and clearer. It really did seem like a real place that existed. No way. Is this for real? There is no way I'm this lucky. It doesn't make sense to have a pretty, naked woman sunbathing here in the desert. This must be a hallucination. It must be. The Black Desert does not have a human shelter. Hansen did not believe what he was seeing was actually true. The beautiful woman lay in front of Hansen, facing down. She wore sunglasses, and beside her was some juice and snacks. She appeared to be asleep. Hallucination. It has to be a hallucination. Hansen was now in front of the shore-haired lady. He reached his hand out to grab the woman's bubble but to confirm the validity of his vision, and was surprised to feel that her skin was smooth and bouncy to the touch. He could even feel the sunscreen that had been rubbed in. H.M., maybe I was wrong. This does seem real. Hansen thought it felt really good, so he squeezed her but some more. A second later, however, the shore-haired lady woke up. She turned her head in a sleepy fashion and said, Little Orange, don't do that. I'm trying to sunbathe here. When her eyesight came into focus, and she saw Hansen with a hand still firmly clasped on her buttock, she completely froze. They both locked gazes with each other for a few seconds before the woman snapped, which led to a scream echoing across the black desert. Chapter 734 Spirit? Her beautiful legs were like two lashing dragons, attempting to capture Hansen like a pair of scissors. They looked ready to cut him down right then and there. Hansen kept evading her capture and tried to plead with the woman, saying, Lady, I have been wandering the black desert by myself for far too long. I thought I had encountered a mirage. I was only concerned with checking whether or not my eyes were playing tricks on me. Although he wasn't telling her the whole truth, he was never going to admit how he actually enjoyed playing with her But I'm going to kill you. The woman did not care for his words and continued trying to attack Han Sr. If you want to kill me, can you at least put on some clothes first? Hansen kept stepping backwards, talking to her. Things had gone a little haywire, and viewing her flailing naked body was getting a little awkward. The woman froze and screamed once more. The next second, the woman summoned armor to clothe her body. She gritted her teeth and resumed her attempts to attack Hans Sr. Lady, you must believe me. I am a soldier with ethics. Hansen thought he had heard these words spoken somewhere before, and so he used them. The woman continued as if she were both deaf and mad, and her attempts to attack Hansen did not slow down. Lady, if you keep doing this, I will have to be rude. You won't be able to blame me for what happens next. It is daytime, and you are without clothes in public. Sunbathing or not, I am not the only person who would stop to admire you, Hansen said. Screw your public. Aside from you, what other perverts might be hiding around here? Huh, the lady spoke amidst her frantic attempts to attack Han Sr. Hansen just now noticed there was no one else in the city. Aside from the shore-haired lady, the local vicinity was entirely dead. Even after using Da Shan Aura, he could not detect the presence of any other life forces in the area. There's only you here in this city? Hansen asked the woman while dodging and blocking her attacks. The lady no longer answered him and continued trying to attack Han Sr. Hansen's principles were simple. If he was able to explain a predicament first, he would. If he couldn't, fight first and talk later. Hansen then used one hand to grab the lady's leg and the other hand to grab her fist. Then he pulled and flipped her onto the ground. 
The lady used her other hand to try to fight back against Hans' senator. He grabbed the fist and pulled her arm behind her back. Then, he pulled out the platinum chain on his waist and tied her legs and arms together. After that, he picked her up in one arm. Asshole. Let me go. The woman was very stubborn and was not keen to give up. She now tried to use her teeth to bite Hans Sen, but from the way she was being held, she could not reach him despite her best attempts. When you calm down, I'll let you go. Hansen continued to hold the lady who had been tied up. He picked up one of her beverages and started to drink it. Cool. Hansen drank three of her beverages and belched loudly. You are an asshole, obscene and cheap. Don't touch my beverages. The lady became even angrier as she watched Hansen consume her drinks. Hansen ignored her and carried her into the city. The city was desolate. The ruined remnants of old stone houses were all that was there. Dust and sand had caked much of the ruins, and it looked like no one had lived there for many years. There was no trace of occupation to be found. Hansen proceeded towards the plaza. A small shelter like this did not contain teleporters in ordinary rooms, only public ones in either the plaza or spirit hall. The plaza wasn't very big, and the floor was comprised of many yellow tiles. It was rather clean there, as if someone had taken the time to clean up. But when Hansen saw the teleporter, he was disappointed. The teleporter appeared to be damaged and inoperable. Hansen walked deeper and deeper into the city, but found little more than lines of ruined houses, sand, and dust. The houses were only two stories tall, but there was a spirit hall. The spirit hall stood out amongst the rest, at four stories tall. Hansen walked before the spirit hall, and the woman suddenly appeared frightened and said, Don't go in. Leave this place. Why? Hansen noticed she finally appeared to be willing to talk, so he lowered his head to ask her. You can't go in there because you can't, the short-haired woman said, as she gritted her teeth. Hansen noticed her resume talking nonsense and ignored her. He walked forward. Stop. Don't go in. There is a scary spirit in there, the short-haired lady quickly shouted. Hansen lifted his lips and told her, but it's such a small shelter. This is a noble shelter at the most. So what manner of scary spirit can possibly reside here? Besides, if there is one, how have you managed to teleport in and out of this place? There really is a spirit in there, and I have never left this place, the short-haired woman stressed. PFFF. Don't tell me those beverages came with you on a journey here. Hansen was not buying her story. When the short-haired lady heard that, she thought about Hansen not only squeezing her butt, but also drinking the beverages she had held on to for so long and the fact he drank three, all at once. Angrily, she said, Yes, that is right, you big horny asshole. Give me back my beverages. PFFF. Hansen still did not believe her. Still carrying the woman, he approached the door and pushed it open. Hansen had already used his dog shin aura to take a peek inside, but couldn't detect anything. Therefore, he believed she was lying. Don't go. There really is a scary spirit in there and you'll regret stepping inside. Let me go and die inside there all alone. Don't drag me down to hell with you. The short-haired lady noticed he was ignoring her plights and warnings, so she did her best to persuade him not to open the door. She almost cried aloud. The moment Hansen stepped into the spirit hall, his heart jumped. A scary force approached him like a black shadow or a toxic snake. Dong. Hansen held his flaming wreck spike horizontally and blocked the shadow-like snake. He saw what appeared to be an arm-thick, black chain wrap itself around his wreck spike. On the other side of the black chain, a person appeared to be holding it, clad in broken armor. He was impaled on a black pillar, and the chain he wielded led through his body and into the stone behind him. The man looked pretty but cold, and he had long, narrow eyes. He had two fox ears in his long black hair. He coldly looked at Hansen, as his long fingers clasped the other end of the chain. Chapter 735, Little Orange. Dong. The man yanked the chain, and a powerful force tugged Hansen towards him. Hansen was shocked, but he let go of the flaming wreck spike that had become entangled with the chain. Hansen summoned his snow lady bee's soul and combined with it, returning the wreck spike as he did so. The man lashed his black chain, which had split into a thousand smaller snakes that sought to latch onto Hans' senator if he didn't do something he'd be covered in a legion of the slithering fiends. Oh no, I'm dead. Did you just want someone to die alongside you, so you didn't have to die alone? I have never had a boyfriend, and I have never had sex. I don't want to die yet. 
The short-haired lady was still under Han Sen's arm, and seeing the black chains, she almost started to cry. But then Han Sen moved his body. With the lady in hand, he managed to weave and evade every single chain lash. The attacker looked spooked, and so he lashed his chain again. The black chain that he wielded looked alive, and it turned into a toxic snake that tried to snap and bite Han Sr. Hansen ran between the chains, and no matter how frightening the weapon was, it could not touch him. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. The short-haired lady felt like a passenger in a car, driving at top speed along a cliffside. Any second, the car might tip and send her plummeting to the distant ground below. The short-haired lady's eyes were starting to water. Hansen had the skills to dodge the attacks, however. If the short-haired lady had been left to her own devices, she'd have been snatched up by the chain in an instant. But still, being held by Han Sin and having her life put entirely within his hands was more terrifying than anything else imaginable. Han Sin's face was starting to look gloomy, though, and he was already pushing his Dong Xian Sutra to the max. All he could do was continue to dodge the man's chain, and no matter how much he tried, he couldn't find a window of opportunity sufficient for him to make an exit. This is a super spirit, that's for sure. But why has it been locked up in here like this? Hansen pondered the peculiarity of Spirit's situation as he observed the hall and between his evasions of the attacks. There was no statue in the hall, just one black pillar. There were two black chains that were each as thick as an arm. They were wielded by the Spirit, yes, but they were attached to the pillar through exposed wounds in the man's chest. The man had less than one meter leniency in movement, and the chain he used was one of the two that bound him to the pillar. Hansen used Dong Shen Aura but was unable to observe the man's energy. Hansen tried escaping six times, but his withdrawal was prohibited each time by the chain. But still, the chain had yet to hit him, and Hansen's continued evasion was fueled by his simulation of Light Son of God's energy flow through Dong Shen Sutra. The fact that he was up against a chained up super spirit began to grate on Hansen. However, he believed he should have had more than what it took to defeat such a foe, and his inability to do so made him sulk. Still, he knew it would be best for him to try to escape right then, and so that was where he utilized his power. Every time he attempted to flee, he was pulled back for some reason. He didn't feel anything, but the short-haired lady was in tears as if she was riding a roller coaster. She had screamed so much, she had now lost her voice. With a sobbing, tear-drenched face, all she could do was helplessly remain carried in Han Sen's arms. Although he was unable to observe the man's energy flow, he could still memorize the pattern and methodology of how the man used the chain. If he learned his chain skill and understood all his movements, he could escape the spirit hall without issue. Fortunately, the spirit itself was chained to the pillar and unable to move. If it wasn't chained up, he wouldn't have concerned himself with fighting the spirit and would have just summoned his little angel instead. But battles such as this were very educational for Han's senator, he rarely encountered a weapon such as this, so viewing it was quite the surprise. Hansen was now getting quite excited. He almost forgot about the crying woman under his arm. His mind excitedly raced to find a way in which he might shatter the chain that was used against him. After an hour of this, Hansen finally managed to exit the hall. The spirit's full power was undoubtedly restricted by its binding. Why is that spirit chained up here? There is no statue or spirit stone here. It's pretty strange to say the least. Because he had no spirit stone, Hansen had no particular interest in killing the spirit. Killing him did not provide Hansen any benefit, and instead, it might only aid his attacker. If the spirit died, it would simply respawn at its own spirit stone, and it would not be trapped like it was now. You damn pervert. Let me go. The short-haired lady whose face was painted with dried-up tear marks, felt her waist begin to hurt. Sorry, I forgot all about you. Hansen only now remembered he was carrying a beautiful lady. He put her back and removed the platinum chain he had used to bind her. The short-haired lady tried to stand up, but her waist was very sore. Her whole body was feeling numb, too. She stood up halfway, but then stumbled and fell back into Hansen's arms. Hansen helped her stand up straight, smiled, and said, Lady, I know I am handsome, but please slow down. There is no need to literally throw yourself into my arms. I am not willing to date just anyone. It is important that we get to know each other first. You go to hell. The lady pushed Hansen away and sat down on a stone stair, feeling somewhat crippled. She then began rubbing her sore waist. 
Hansen wanted to flirt with the lady for a bit longer and perhaps come to learn of what might have happened here. But suddenly, he felt a scary presence dawn someplace outside the city walls. It was moving quickly. Hansen seemed glum and looked out towards the city gate. He asked the short-haired woman, Lady, aside from this spirit, do any other horrible creatures reside in the area? The short-haired lady did not answer. Hansen heard loud footsteps, however, and then he saw a creature that looked like a cat. It looked like a cat, but it was as large as an elephant. It had orange fur and was stomping towards them. Hansen frowned. With the life force he could sense, he acknowledged it as a super creature. Little orange, good timing. This big pervert has been trying to bully me, so get over here and kick his ass. The short-haired lady saw the super creature and suddenly looked overjoyed. She leapt onto the back of the cat and stroked its head. With a paw, it pointed towards Hans Sr. The creature used its big round eyes to look at Hansen and then let out a fearsome cry. Meow. Chapter 736. A Shelter for One. Watching an extra-large orange fur ball approach with haste, the silver fox that was still perched on Hansen's shoulder moved before its master could. The silver fox's hair all stood up, and a charge of silver light began to form across its pelt. With a fierce discharge, a silver thunderbolt struck the super creature that the shore-haired lady referred to as Little Orange. Meow. Arg. The shrill shriek of the cat, and the sharp scream of pain from the lady that mounted it, sounded at the same time. The hair of Little Orange all stood on end following the strike, and the hair of the shore-haired lady looked as if it had been set ablaze. Unmoving, she fell from the back of the cat. Little Orange, after its shock, blazed with anger and leapt towards Hans Sen and the Silver Fox. The Silver Fox did not wait a second, and it quickly dismounted its master's shoulder. It jumped into the air and fired more thunderbolts while airborne. The Little Orange once again reeled back, squealing in pain. But despite the pain it was suffering, it was in no mood to submit and yield just yet. The Silver Fox was its primary target, and the cat did its best to snare the silver fox that repeatedly glided through the air, zipping back and forth. Although Little Orange's speed was fairly impressive, it was not enough for it to nab the silver fox. Every time the silver fox evaded an attack, it zapped its foe. The silver fox could not fly high, but it didn't have to. It only flew high enough that Little Orange was unable to grab it. It was frustrating for the cat, who oh so desired the furry felon that outwitted it. For Hansen, it was an amusing sight. Although Little Orange was much larger than the Silver Fox, they were both juvenile super creatures. The cat looked like it had been born before the Silver Fox, but somehow it seemed to be in alliance with the short-haired lady. The short-haired lady was frozen while watching her cat get bullied. She was quite surprised earlier, when Hansen managed to escape from the spirit hall without suffering harm. But now, she was even more surprised that the little pervert's silver fox pet could challenge her own. And the way it attacked was more of a fun-making tease than anything. Birds of a feather flocked together. The short-haired lady shouted aloud, despite the fear that started to encroach upon her mind. When Zhou Yumei became an evolver and entered the second god sanctuary, she never expected she would be sent to a dump like this. Not a single human populated the region, and when she first came here, she witnessed a creature battling a spirit. That was how she made it out of the spirit hall upon her arrival, and that was how she also became stranded, here in no man's land. Zhou Yumei was fortunate enough to meet Little Orange in the shelter. It did not treat her like an enemy, and it was really nice to her. The reason Zhou Yumei had managed to survive here was all down to Little Orange, as a matter of fact, who frequently went out to collect loot for her. The flesh of the creatures it brought her was of the sacred blood variety which surprised Zhou Yumei a lot. After being together for a long time, the bond between Zhou Yumei and Little Orange had become a strong one. They hunted together often, and she was able to witness how easily Little Orange slew such creatures. But this powerful Little Orange of hers was now getting bullied under an oppressive little fox, and she was starting to grow a touch worried over its well-being. Zhou Yumei turned to look at Hansen with her concerned expression, but she was surprised to see him already walking closer. He wore a smile, and a horny glint twinkled in his eye as he returned her a gaze. What do you want? I'm warning you. I am a powerful evolver. Keep your hands to yourself, and do not attempt anything stupid. Zhou Yumei asserted a battle position as she gave Hansen her warning. Her proclamations of strength were untrue, however, 
and the faint tone of power she tried to force did not work. She lacked the intimidation she desired. After all, she had been easily restrained by Hansen earlier, and now her greatest pillar of support, her pet little orange, was getting played with by the man's pet silver fox. It couldn't help her at all, despite its desire, and this started to make her panic. Let me ask you a few questions first. If your answers satiate my curiosity, I will forget that orange fur ball ever tried to attack me. Otherwise. Before Hansen finished his sentence, he laughed twice with a menacing tone. Otherwise what? Zhou Yume's heart was struck with a chill after seeing Hansen laugh. Since there are only the two of us here, whatever transpires between us can only be kept like so. If I am in a good mood, I will rape you and then kill you. If I am in a bad mood, I will kill you and then rape you. If my mood is ambivalent, then I'll just kill you while I rape you, Hansen bluffed. When Zhou Yume heard him speak those words, her skin flared with goosebumps. She forced herself to present a cute smile and with a voice of pleading, she begged, Oh, big brother, there is no need for you to do something like that. We are both humans, aren't we? And in this grand second god sanctuary, we were fortunate to cross paths. Our encounter has to be one of fate. We should help each other, not antagonize each other. What is your name? Hansen gave Zhou Yume a deep stare as he asked. My name is Zhou Yume. I hail from a poor family of minor prominence. I worked my hardest to become an evolver, and I cannot believe I ended up here in this place. Not a single other person exists here, and it seems like I cannot leave. I almost died here. Meeting you was a stroke of luck, indeed. Zhou Yume looked very pitiable right now. Put away the acting talent. You are very young and powerful to have joined the second god sanctuary. You must have maxed out your sacred geno points to become an evolver. And you were saying you hail from a poor family? Hansen spoke with disdain. Zhou Yume presented an awkward smile and said, Well, I'm all right. I'm poorer than most rich people, but I suppose I'm a little wealthier than most poor people. Just be honest with me. Do you think I won't hesitate to strip you naked and throw you into the spirit hall? Hansen gave her a grim face as he told her this. Okay, brother. I will tell you everything you wish to know. Zhou Yume was spooked by Hansen once again. Hansen was then quickly educated on who she was and the relationship she shared with Little Orange. Zhou Yume was quite something, and she was a councilman's child. Although there were many children in the Zhou family, not all possessed power. But being an evolver with maxed out sacred geno points, at such a young age, suggested she was quite powerful amongst the members of her family. Hansen then learned all about Zhou Yume and Little Orange's bond, which wasn't all too different from his with the Silver Fox. Such a thing was very rare, as creatures didn't often come to acknowledge humans as potential masters. Little Orange was a second-generation super creature, and Hansen knew this by observing its energy flow. The first generation, its mother, must have been the creature she had witnessed battling the spirit. Who knew what had happened there? Zhou Yume then provided Hansen with some intel about various landmarks of the encompassing area that interested him. Chapter 737 To Escape or Not to Escape The Silver Fox continued playing with Little Orange, getting it to chase itself around and around. While this was occurring, Hansen lay down on Zhou Yume's bench. He drank another one of her beverages, and at the same time, asked her questions that piqued his widespread curiosity. Zhou Yume's heart began to bleed when she witnessed Hansen resume drinking her beverages. She had been saving them for half a year, but she had to concede and allow it and answer every question Hansen posed. One can after another, Hansen drank. He had been traversing the desert for quite some time, and he had grown tired of the repetitive taste of nutrient solutions. Having long fancied the taste of something else, he couldn't quite help himself from taking her drinks. He had drunk so much that her coveted trove of drinks had now been depleted, and only one remained. When his devilish hands reached out to grab it, Zhou Yume reached a breaking point. She could no longer restrain herself, and so she lunged out to grab the can. She quickly opened it and gulped it down in one large swig. After she was done, it was as if it had instilled her with a renewed confidence. She chucked the can away looked at Hansen, and told him, Do whatever you want to me. I would rather die with dignity. Hansen took off the sunglasses he was wearing, which also belonged to Zhou Yume, and looked at her face, which spoke of a willingness to accept death. Then he said, Your dignity is equivalent to the worth of a soda can? Zhou Yume's face went all red. She had been stuck in this place for the longest time, 
and the drink and snacks she had kept were a suspension and fortification of her hope. Now, that had been ruined by Hans' senator that was why she could no longer hold her tongue and lashed out, but unfortunately for her, Hansen had a quick-witted, forked tongue. The words made her regret saying anything. Seeing Zhou Yume hold her own tongue once more, Hansen hopped off the bench. This shocked Zhou Yume. She took a few steps backward and asked, What are you doing? What? Must I report my comings and goings to you or something? Hansen smiled at Zhou Yume. No. You aren't. What? Zhou Yume's tongue tangled itself, tripping her words. She looked happy. If you really want to die, I can aid you in accomplishing this desire, Hansen said. No. You commit to your own deeds. I can take care of that myself. Zhou Yume was starting to talk nonsense. Hansen ignored her, for she was just a young woman. He only wanted to tease her, not outright bully her. Pervert. Horny bastard. Asshole. Animal. Obscene. Cheap. Watching Hansen enter the city and end up a good distance away from her, Zhou Yume spoke as many profanities about him as she could. Zhou Yume was a little depressed. The shelter was far too small, and if she had to remain here with the horny bad guy, problems were bound to occur at some point. I'm so young and sexy. I have a great figure. There is no way that bad guy will refrain from touching me. Should I escape into the desert now? But then again, I have no idea where I am or where I might go. And there are so many creatures out there, it'd be dangerous. If I don't escape, the holy temple of my body will be desecrated by that bad guy. Zhou Yume struggled with the decision. The silver fox eventually got tired of running around, and it ended up taking a rest on the city's gate. It looked down on Little Orange, which was still down below, meowing at him. Little Orange had grown tired too, and despite its meowing, it didn't bother jumping up. Whether it was too tired or simply understood its inability to ever catch the silver fox, she didn't know. The pet is just like the master. All it does is infuriate others. They are both just as bad as each other, Zhou Yume thought to herself, as she peered at the silver fox that was resting above the gate. She was mad. She didn't want to provoke it, however, as she had seen and felt firsthand how powerful the silver fox was. And so, she still contemplated whether or not she should escape. It was almost sunset by now, and she couldn't come to a decision. If Han Sin was an ugly bastard, Zhou Yume would have already run off a long time ago. But the guy was fairly handsome, and quite clean. He didn't look all too scary or villainous, and that was the reason she refrained from running away the moment he left her. Strange, what is he doing in the city, anyway? Why has he been in there for so long? Zhou Yume suddenly realized he had been in there for a whole afternoon and wondered why he had not yet emerged. She knew all about the city, and she knew there was nothing particularly special about the place. All that was there was a well that could provide water. She then believed Hansen had gone off in search of water and felt relieved at his disappearance. She feared if he returned, he might hurt her. The time she had spent contemplating her decision of whether or not to stay had made her oblivious to Hansen's disappearance up until now, as well. But now she started to worry for him. He had been gone for an entire afternoon, after all. Hey, are you in there? Zhou Yume called out from the outside. What is he doing in there? Zhou Yume bit her lip and tiptoed into the city. She sleuthed around carefully in search of him, so she could maybe catch a look at what he had gotten up to during his absence. But after walking around for some time, she couldn't find him. That's strange. Where did he go? Has he left this place? Zhou Yume mumbled these words beneath her breath, which made her feel a little strange. As she was doing this, it was too late for her to notice. She tripped over something and ended up on the ground. Ouch. Zhou Yume cried out in pain. When she raised her head, she noticed Hansen standing right in front of her. In one hand, he held a cake. In the other, a freshly brewed beverage. She also noticed he had changed his clothes, and his hair was damp. His body exuded a pleasant body wash fragrance. He had been in the shower. On his back was a rucksack, stuffed to the brim with more snacks and drinks. Where did you get all that from? Zhou Yume asked, with eyes open wide. I bought it, of course. How else would I get it? Hansen gave her a look as if he was witnessing the feverish question of a madwoman. No, that's not what I meant. Where did you buy all this from? Zhou Yume quickly asked. I bought it from a vending machine. Where else could I buy them? Hansen returned a question. Zhou Yume believed she was going insane. 
Without a care for how powerful he was, she grabbed Han Sen's arm and asked, You can leave this place? Well, duh. How else could I have bought such stuff? Hansen smiled. How did you get out? Isn't there a spirit guarding the teleporter? Zhou Yumei asked with giddy excitement. I just walked. After Hansen said this, he shook off her hand and called for the silver fox. He fed it a Geno creation pill. Hey, handsome, can you take me for a walk, as well? Zhou Yumei got closer to Hansen and held his shoulder, twirling cutely. Chapter 738 Twin Tail Purple Scorpion No. Hansen pushed her away and went back to lie down on the bench. Why? I can pay you. Zhou Yumei quickly suggested. It's because I can't. That's why, Hansen replied coldly. You. Zhou Yumei quickly got angry, wishing she could just bite Han Senator, but she knew she couldn't compete with him, despite her desire for him to escort her out of that place. Big brother, if I offended you earlier, in any capacity, it was because of how young and reckless I was back then. Could you find it in your heart to forgive me? Zhou Yumei held on to the urge to try to strangle Han Senator. She hovered around him in a cute pose, smiling fondly towards him as she spoke. Okay, I forgive you. Hansen nodded. Brilliant. Then come on, let's go. I'll pay you back once we're free from this place. When should we head out? Zhou Yumei had been driven slightly mad after being here all alone for so long. Humans desired and required social correspondence and they always lived together. She, however, had been stuck in this place for over a year all by herself. If it wasn't for the presence of Little Orange, she would most likely have been driven completely insane. Although her initial encounter with Hansen had been a bad one, her desire for contact with someone else, no matter who that was, overcame her wrath. That was why she had made the decision to stay. She was afraid of being alone once more. And even if it was with a bad person or a person she would incessantly argue with, it was better than being alone. I told you I forgave you, didn't I? I didn't say I'd take you out of this place, Hansen calmly told her. You, what do you want? Zhou Yumei almost fainted in anger, and her finger trembled as she pointed it at Han Sr. Nothing. I just don't want to commit to the effort of getting you out of here, Hansen told her, drinking his beverage. Saving people was a good thing but it was more often than not a troublesome task. If he brought Zhou Yumei out with him now, the Zhou family would most likely be made aware of the connection he had with her. If he didn't bring Zhou Yumei, perhaps the Zhou family would hate him for it. If Hansen tried escorting her away, and something was to happen to her while she was in his hands, the Zhou family would be out for his blood, too. Perhaps the Zhou family would be understanding, but with what he had recently been embroiled in, he wanted to be more careful. He would rather have her see him as a bad guy than end up in trouble. If Zhou Yumei followed him, he would have liked to bring her along. If something did happen through such a circumstance, perhaps the Zhou family would not treat him as a foe. Zhou Yumei was fuming mad, but she knew there was nothing she could do. She couldn't beg, fight, or do anything for him. Suddenly, Zhou Yumei's eyes drifted to the snacks Hansen had brought with him. She suddenly grabbed the bag and ran. While she ran off, she said, you drank all my beverages. This is payment for that. Zhou Yumei quickly jumped on top of Little Orange and presented Hansen with an ugly face. She pulled the drinks and snacks out of the rucksack and shouted to Hansen, Since you aren't going to make an effort to bring me away from this place, I'm going eat all the snacks envisioning they are you. Zhou Yumei imagined the snacks were Hansen, and so she ripped, tore, and bit into them to release her anger. It had been a long time since she last ate and drank like that. Once her belly had been stuffed and she couldn't eat anymore, she went asleep atop Little Orange. When Zhou Yumei next woke up, she noticed Hansen and the Silver Fox were gone. She thought Hansen had returned to the Alliance for a while and would come back shortly, but after he had disappeared for a whole day, she began to get worried. Hansen had previously asked her what points of interest there were in the area, and she had informed him of a black mountain that wasn't too far off. That mountain was inhabited by a strange twin-tail purple scorpion. It was a creature that even Little Orange was afraid of, and was most likely a fearsome super-creature. When Hansen heard of a lonely super-creature out there, he had shown a feverish desire to slay it. If it was a second-generation super-creature, that would have been the icing on the cake he very much desired. According to the directions Zhou Yumei gave him, Hansen had to walk 100 miles to just about see the mountain in the distance. The mountain did not have a sharpened peak, and was more like a rolling mountain range. 
It was strange to see mountains lined up like so, out in a place such as that. Hansen rode his golden growler towards the mountain, and with the silver fox by his side, all the other creatures that inhabited the area hid. The creatures he did see, however, were not grouped as he expected. The Black Desert was very unique in this aspect, as most of the creatures that inhabited this place tended to be alone. It wasn't long before he began his ascent of the Black Mountains. He managed to detect the life force he had been searching for and hurried his golden growler up the slopes. Eventually, he laid eyes on the twin-tailed purple scorpion, which he found wandering the foothills of the mountain. It was fervently digging into the sand. There were many black rocks in the hole it dug, and it was a trying task for it to remove them. The twin-tailed purple scorpion was one meter deep, but Hansen could not guess what it may have been searching for. Hansen wanted to observe the twin-tailed scorpion's strange behavior for a little while longer, so he did not summon his little angel to immediately attack the fiend. For a better view, he climbed atop a 10-meter tall boulder and then resumed watching the scorpion digging up the rocks. He had become quite keen. While watching, he opened his gene lock with the Dongxian Sutra to observe its energy flow and assert whether or not it was a second-generation super creature as he had hoped it to be. Hansen was disappointed, however. The energy inside the scorpion was all blurred, and he could not watch the energy flow properly, which meant it was only a first-generation super creature. Since it was only a first-generation super creature, all he could hope for by defeating it was a beast soul. The life geno essences weren't useful to him and only fronted a monetary value. Hansen didn't want to sell too many life geno essences, either, as they tended to make others jealous. The entire alliance was currently focusing on him like starved beggars admiring a spit roast. Unsure of what others were thinking, Hansen thought it was best to maintain as low a profile as possible. Let's see if I can get a beast soul, at least. Hansen stared at the twin tail scorpion, knowing that the chances of obtaining a beast soul were low no matter which way it was cut. He had calculated that, even with his own luck, the drop rate for a beast soul was only around 50%. But Hansen was still quite curious, and he was keen to learn what the scorpion was doing. It continued to dig into the black rocks beneath, and by now, it had dug three meters into the ground without slowing down. Is this guy a little too thirsty, maybe? Perhaps it's trying to get some water? Hansen said this in half jest, because he knew that super creatures did not need to eat or drink to survive. Only certain special super creatures or pregnant super creatures would occasionally eat. But even still, he had never seen them drink water. What is it doing? Hansen had a strange feeling while observing this. Chapter 739 Dark Silkworm Hansen watched the scorpion for a while as it continued to dig. It kept on digging until it vanished from sight, and all Hansen could see was the remaining presence of a hole. Hansen summoned his wings and flew up high to get an aerial view of the hole. Upon inspection, he noted that the hole was a dozen meters deep, and it eventually opened up into a cave or cavern of sorts. There has to be something special down there. Hansen was surprised, and so he summoned his super armor and ventured inside with his silver fox in hand. Once he had dropped down into the cave, he noticed the presence of an opening in one of the walls. He ventured closer to have a look and what he saw surprised him. There was a further cavern inside, one that was massive. He couldn't even begin to predict how large it was. It was decorated in bamboo-like fauna and flora, many of which reached up to the cavern ceiling. It was an incredible sight. The twin-tailed scorpion was inside, snapping the bamboo-like plants. The shoots were hollow inside but many of them contained big white bugs, not too dissimilar to silkworms. They were only about 10 centimeters long, but they looked juicy and fat. The scorpion ate the white bugs and bamboo together, which produced an echoing munching sound. Are those white bugs creatures, by any chance? If the scorpion is eating, that most likely means it is pregnant. Hansen reviewed the situation and asked himself a number of questions. The bamboo and the white bugs in the cave were eaten in droves by the hungry scorpion. Eventually, it looked to be full and wanted to leave, and so it started to return in Hansen's direction. Hansen quickly made his exit and evaded the scorpion's sight. It wasn't long before the scorpion itself re-emerged, and when it did, it went up the mountain. Hansen did not give the scorpion chase. If it really was pregnant, he knew it'd be a waste to kill it now. He much preferred the idea of waiting until it had given birth before slaying it and the baby. But Hansen still had a strong interest in the bamboo he had observed down below. 
and the white bugs they seemed to contain. He waited until the scorpion was long gone and then, with a command for the silver fox to stand guard, ventured back inside. He didn't want to risk having the scorpion return and corner him. There were many bamboo-looking plants in the cavern, and they were about 30 centimeters in diameter. Many of them had already been snapped in two by the scorpion, following its visit, so there was a lot strewn across the ground. This included many of the white bugs the scorpion had missed. The white bugs were pale and semi-translucent, and you could see the blood vessels inside them. The bugs that were on the ground were wriggling around. They tried slithering back into the broken bamboo shoots, but they had some difficulty. They couldn't enter the perfect bamboo. Hansen picked up a broken shoot of bamboo and tried to crush it in his hands, but could not. He had to amp up his strength and exhaust all the power he could to eventually do so. That's some tough bamboo. Hansen threw the bamboo on the floor and then summoned his peacock crossbow. He loaded it with a Z-steel bolt and fired it at one of the bugs that was trying to crawl its way into one of the broken bamboo ends. The Z-steel bolt pierced through the white bug's body, which made it squeal and release a white fog. The temperature began to drop, and the little area around the bug got all frosty. The bug then froze, as if it had just been taken out of the freezer. Mutant creature hunted. Dark silkworm. The beast's soul has not been acquired. Consume its flesh to obtain a random numeric amount of mutant geno points, ranging from 0 to 10. The voice rang in Hans Sin's head, which surprised Hans Sr. It's a mutant creature, but how can a mutant creature release frosty air? This is strange. I thought only super creatures could wield elemental attacks. Hansen was curious, and so he summoned his flaming wreck spike to kill more of the silkworms on the ground. Over and over, the announcement continued to pop. When the dark silkworms were killed, they each let out a frosty air. The creatures were weak and unable to fight, so Hansen was able to hack them up casually and without worry. Mutant creature hunted. Dark silkworm. The beast's soul has been acquired. Consume its flesh to obtain a random numeric amount of mutant geno points, ranging from 0 to 10. After Hansen hunted 30 silkworms, he finally heard the announcement that indicated ownership of a dark silkworm. Hansen then quickly looked up the beast soul's info, keen to learn what type it was. Mutant dark silkworm, one time use hidden weapon. Hansen was pleasantly surprised, as it had been a long time since he had last seen a one time use beast soul. It was rare to find hidden weapon beast souls and he wondered which one that might have been. Hansen summoned the mutant dark silkworm, which sprouted a big, white, and fat bug on the palm of Hansen's hand. It was rather heavy. He looked at it for a while, unsure of what it did. After some thought, he threw it at the cavern wall. Ping! The fat bug hit the wall and exploded. It unleashed a heavy, white mist. The fog's radius was about a meter, and the stone wall it had been thrown upon was caked in a layer of ice. This is interesting. Hansen was rather shocked while looking at it. It was just a mutant class beast soul, yet it could unleash a certain frosty power. This was not normal at all. I wonder if there are any sacred blood class dark silkworms here? If I can get a sacred blood class dark silkworm, it might come in handy. Hansen killed all the silkworms he could see, but was mildly disappointed to learn that each one was a mutant class variant. No matter how many he killed, it didn't seem as if sacred blood types existed. There were 60 dead silkworms on the floor by now, and after a moment of thinking, he used the flaming wreck spike to strike the bamboo. He watched how many of the silkworms came flying out of the bamboo. After killing a hundred more of the Wrigley silkworms, he managed to obtain another two mutant beast souls. But still, no sacred blood types. Never mind. Let me pack up the ones I've already killed and vacate the area. If I dry them up and grind them into powder, People who eat them will be able to increase their mutant geno points with ease. That's not too bad. Hansen used a bag to collect the hundred frozen silkworm bodies and turned around to go outside and dry them. There were many silkworms in that subterranean forest, and there seemed to be at least ten of them in every single shoot of bamboo. If he wanted to harvest them all, he couldn't imagine how long that might have taken. Hansen planned to temporarily give up killing the silkworms, wanting to wait until the scorpion came back ate its fill, and gave birth. Once the scorpions had been dealt with, Hansen had the idea of returning here to harvest and collect the rest of the silkworms, free from possible intrusion. After Hansen picked up all the silkworms he had killed, Hansen suddenly heard a noise come from deeper within the bamboo forest. It seemed that something was emerging from further within. 
Chapter 740 Ice Silkworm Hansen put away his energy and immediately retreated, and then used his jade skin to unlock his gene lock. Although Dong Shin Sutra and Jade Skin were comparable after opening the gene lock, there were still some notable differences. Jade Skin also focused on enhancing the seventh sense, although although it wasn't as detailed as the Dong Shin Sutra, it had a greater range. The range of the Dong Shin Sutra's enhancement to the seventh sense was limited to the length of the Dong Shin Aura. Hansen scanned the bamboo forest with alertness, as if he had activated God Mode. With his senses, he was able to determine that something was traveling towards him at a rapid pace. It was currently three miles away, but that distance was sure to close fast. Hansen could sense its approximate size, and deduced it was around the size of an average household cat. Its shape was circular, like the grubs he had just harvested. What it wasn't was slow. Unlike said bugs, what was coming towards him was very fast. Like a mad rabbit, it came running. Is it a sacred blood dark silkworm? The thought of this made Hansen quite happy. As time ticked by, the unseen menace closed the gap between them. When it emerged, Hansen was finally able to see that it was an extra-large grub. Its body glistened like ice. A frost aura encompassed it, and it left a trail of ice in its wake. Hansen switched his gene lock over to Dong Shen Sutra and took a reading of the icy fiend that had approached. Its life force was far stronger than mutant, and was indeed most likely a sacred blood-class silkworm. The happiness in Hansen's heart had taken root, and so he retrieved his peacock crossbow and loaded it with a Z-steel bolt. He took aim at the bamboo forest, and when it was close enough, he'd pull the trigger and swiftly end its life. More than anything, he wanted to see if there was a beast soul to be obtained from it. As the distance between Hansen and the ice silkworm got smaller and smaller, however, he started to feel as if something wasn't quite right. The closer it came, the stronger the life force of the silkworm became. It soon exceeded the measure of any sacred blood creature he had dealt with before. Is it a super creature? Hansen's face changed. He scanned it multiple times to gain a more accurate reading, but it still left him as puzzled as ever. It was definitely not a super creature. Berserk sacred blood? Perhaps? Hansen squinted his eyes. He rarely encountered berserk sacred blood creatures out in the wild so he was surprised at his discovery of one here, of all places. Watching the ice silkworm draw nearer and nearer, it had now come within 1,000 meters of Han's senator he refocused his peacock crossbow, but then heard more noises from the bamboo forest. Russell, Russell. It now seemed like an entire choir of creatures were frantically racing through the forest. At this, Hansen's face changed. Now, he was seeing a large number of icy silkworms emerge from somewhere in the bamboo woods. From his quick, initial tally, he managed to count a hundred of them. Impossible. How can there be so many berserk sacred blood creatures in one spot? Hansen was rightfully shocked. They didn't frighten him, as he knew they were of no match for him. He just thought the number of them was scary. Hansen could accept the presence of a dozen sacred blood creatures, but berserk sacred blood creatures were far rarer. The ratio of sacred blood to berserk sacred blood was somewhere in the ballpark of 100 to 1. But now, berserk sacred blood creatures were emerging as a massive group. If there were that many berserk sacred blood creatures, then there had to be thousands of ordinary sacred blood silkworms someplace in the area, as well. Still, such an occurrence had to be impossible. The ice silkworms he was currently sensing were stronger than most sacred blood creatures. The strength of their energy flow was not too far off the bloodhorn shura he had encountered not too long ago. One silkworm was ahead of the rest and the gap between it and Han Sin was now under 500 meters. He pulled out his peacock crossbow, took aim, and pulled the trigger. Instead of guessing, Hansen wanted to kill one and find out the truth. The harlight string moved and the Z-steel bolt took flight. It was like a beam of light, traveling 500 meters in the blink of an eye. It pierced through the ice silkworm's body and pinned it to the ground. Hansen was delightfully surprised, thinking the silkworms were easier to kill than he initially imagined they would be. If it was a berserk sacred blood creature, he expected it would be able to react or even evade the bolt. But it didn't. It was struck, and it died. Simple as that. Mutant creature hunted. Dark silkworm. The beast's soul has not been acquired. Consume its flesh to obtain a random numeric amount of mutant geno points, ranging from 0 to 10. Hansen suddenly froze with his jaw agape. He was like that for quite a bit. This isn't right. That can't be right. 
How can that be a mutant silkworm? How can a mutant class creature possess such a high life force? Hansen couldn't believe the fat eyes silkworm was the same creature as the dark silkworms from earlier. But the announcement in his head could not be incorrect. It was a rule of the world he inhabited. If it said he killed a mutant creature, then he did indeed kill a mutant creature. Seeing more and more silkworms approach, Hansen ran ahead to kill them all. They were mutant-class dark silkworms, same as the ones he had killed inside and outside the bamboo shoots earlier. Hansen was perplexed and not yet able to think of a reason why their bodies would be so vastly different. The life force in their bodies was far stronger, and there was no discernible reason why these mutant creatures could possess such strength. This isn't right. It really isn't right. This is strange. It's crazy. These things are weird. How can the silkworms inside the bamboo breathe ice, too? Even sacred blood creatures can't do something like that. There must be an external force affecting these little icy blobs, one that I have not yet been made aware of. Whatever it is, it's imbuing them with frightening strength. Hansen killed the hundred big silkworms that approached and managed to obtain one additional beast soul. Hansen quickly summoned it to take a look. Its definition was the same, but its physical appearance was different. The head was bigger and the body was practically ice. Hansen threw it at a wall like before to check it out. It was much more powerful than the others, and the icy fog it unleashed had a radius of three meters. The frosty air itself was far more powerful, too. If they are both mutant dark silkworms, why is there such a clear difference between the two? If I killed baby ones earlier and mature ones just now, it shouldn't affect the beast soul I just received. Beast souls do not factor in the age of a creature. This mystery is getting deeper. I wonder, what is the cause for this curious anomaly? Hansen observed the bamboo stalks with a bewildered face and inquisitive heart. I have to examine and analyze this further. I need to go deeper and I need to find out what is affecting these strange silkworms. Silkworms have great genes, but it is a large race and they cannot all be mutant class, surely. There have to be ordinary ones out there, too. The fact that all these are mutant-class dark silkworms is nigh unbelievable. Hansen pondered the matter a little more, but then decided to hail for the silver fox to come down and join him. With the silver fox, he traveled deeper into the bamboo forest. In fear of the silver fox, all the silkworms went into hiding. If they couldn't escape, they'd hide in their bamboo shoots and shiver, which even made the stalks themselves quiver, producing noise like the rustle of leaves in the wind.